intercourse of a small boy is not regarded as a sexual act. In addition to adulterers, Christ, in the story of the Good Samaritan, portrayed the Pharisees as racial bigots, too self-righteous to respond to the suffering of one who was not a Jew. It is true, because of the wickedness of the Canaanites, which included sodomy and infant sacrifice, Israel had been commanded by God to be harsh in her treatment of the inhabitants of the land. God made it clear that the Canaanites were not simply to be avoided, but destroyed. By the time of the New Testament, this method of preserving God's kingdom by separation and the sword had become obsolete. God no longer made a racial difference between men. But the Pharisees were unfazed by God's new agenda. The Talmud was finally written down nearly five centuries after Christ, yet its critical, even homicidal attitudes toward Gentiles might have been lifted out of the book of Joshua. However, the quickest way to grasp the Talmudic view of Gentiles is not directly from the Talmud, but from the Jewish encyclopedias. If we quote an isolated opinion from the Talmud, a rabbi may quickly object, saying, but that is not the overall opinion of the Talmud. That is not the definitive view. What the Jewish encyclopedia provides us is a definitive overview of perhaps hundreds of rabbinic statements on any subject giving us accurate summaries of what the Talmud generally teaches. In its article on Gentiles, the Jewish encyclopedia begins to define what makes a Jew so different from a Gentile. According to the rabbis, only Israelites are men. Gentiles they class not as men, but as barbarians. Since Gentiles are not men in the fullest sense, so the Gentile is not a neighbor of a Jew. Further, since Gentile laws were too crude to admit of reciprocity, meaning too crude to be taken seriously, the Gentile was forever beneath the Jew. Gentiles were outlawed by God from the beginning and thus had no property rights. The Almighty offered the Torah to the Gentile nations also, but since they refused to accept it, he withdrew his shining legal protection from them and transferred their property rights to Israel, who observed his law. Since the Talmud outlawed the child, or issue of a Gentile, as that of a beast, a Gentile had as little legal rights in a Jewish court as did an animal. The Talmud states that if a Gentile sue an Israelite, the verdict is for the defendant, the Israelite. Conversely, if the Israelite is the plaintiff, he obtains full damages. Because the Talmud conspires against Gentiles, if a Jew was ever caught telling a Gentile what the Talmud really says, such a person deserves death. So vile was the nature of a Gentile that the great Simeon ben Yohai said, the best among the Gentiles deserves to be killed. The best of snakes ought to have its head crushed. Jews, however, are exalted beings in the Talmud, worthy of praise. Christ described the Pharisee who blessed himself, saying, I thank thee, Lord, that I am not as other men. An eminent Talmudic rabbi says the same. Blessed be thou who hast not made me a goy or a Gentile. There is a special antagonism between the Talmud and Jesus. The Talmud attacks him everywhere it can, even his mother. Mary, the Talmud says, was a whore who mated with carpenters. She who was the descendant of princes and governors played the harlot with carpenters. It naturally followed that the scribes declared Christ to be a bastard. In its article on Jesus, the Jewish encyclopedia says that Jewish writings defame Christ. It is the tendency of all these sources to belittle the person of Jesus by ascribing to him illegitimate birth, magic, and a shameful death. Jesus, according to this article, was considered one of the three worst enemies of Judaism who came to an ignoble end. The Talmud says, they subjected him to four deaths, stoning, burning, decapitation, and strangling. The Talmud also says he is now in hell, punished with boiling hot excrement. What is Christ's advice as he speaks to us out of hell? The Jewish encyclopedia quotes Jesus as telling us above all to bless the Jews. He says, further their well-being, do nothing to their detriment. 
Whoever touches them touches even the apple of his eye. Christians, as followers of the false prophet Jesus, also deserve death. The Jewish Encyclopedia again recaps the Talmud's position. A Gentile observing the Sabbath deserves death. It says the Talmud's hatred was probably directed against the Christian Jews. These Judeo-Christians, evasively called Min, Minit, or Minim, were considered by the rabbis to be the most dangerous form of heretics of ancient times. The New Testament Gospels were writings which the rabbis considered more dangerous to the unity of Judaism than those of the pagans. A Talmudic rabbi said, the writings of Christians deserve to be burned for paganism is less dangerous than minute or Christianity. The Jewish Encyclopedia, in its article on men, continues to illustrate the Talmudic hatred of Christianity. Again, we must remember, minim usually indicates the Judeo-Christians. It was forbidden to partake of meat, bread, or wine with the Christian. Scrolls of the law, Tephelin, and Mezuzot, written by a Christian, were burned. An animal slaughtered by a Christian was forbidden food. The relatives of the Christian were not permitted to observe the laws of mourning after his death, but were required to assume festive garments and rejoice. The testimony of a Christian was not admitted in evidence in Jewish courts, and an Israelite who found anything belonging to one who was a Christian was forbidden to return it to him. The Pharisees, through their Talmud, thus gave the Jews an ethic which encouraged bigotry and isolation. But it did worse than that. It invited persecution. By the 11th century, the inhabitants of Babylon, growing weary of the self-righteousness and dishonesty of the Jews, expelled them to the West. Migrating across North Africa and Central Europe, the great majority of Jews who had lived in Babylon for almost 1,600 years now began to find their destinies in the cities of the West. Yet in coming to the West, Jews found their Christian neighbors extremely intolerant of the antisocial deviations Jews had taken for granted in Babylon. In order to survive, it was necessary to abandon such Babylonian traditions. But that was not as easy as it sounds. For a thousand years, the Pharisees had commanded such deviations. Most Jews could not bring themselves to defy the authority of the Pharisees. Enter one of the giants of Judaism of all time, the great Maimonides. Maimonides, a physician and philosopher, knew that no Jew who practiced Babylonian perversions could remain alive in Christian lands. He attempted to harmonize Greek philosophy with the best points of Judaism. He hoped his rationalizations would enable Jews to abandon their antisocial customs. Yet Maimonides was only partly successful. He was excommunicated by the Jewish community on the charge of making new laws. Nevertheless, his moderation and intellect did in fact temper the old Judaism of Babylon. Gradually over the centuries, Jews abandoned immoral practices of the Talmud. Such practices are not observed today. In fact, most Jews are so ignorant of the Talmud itself that they do not even know that such teachings exist within their sacred literature. Yet the fact remains that when the Jews came to the West in the Middle Ages and attempted to accommodate the Talmud to Christian society, a tremendous conflict was created. In Babylon, Judaism could be perfectly consistent with the teachings of the Pharisees because the Babylonians were immoral as well. In Christian lands of the West, it became necessary to pretend that many of those teachings did not exist. Even today, religious Jews continue to venerate the Pharisees and their Talmud as the greatest source of light that Judaism will ever know. Yet, living in Christian lands, no Jew can fully perform what the Pharisees commanded. This conflict in Jewish responsibility has created a dilemma over the last thousand years from which Jews in the West have not emerged. Yet, even before Maimonides came on the scene in the 12th century, Another dilemma was being created in Judaism far to the east. This was a dilemma not concerning the doctrines of the Jews, but over who actually was a Jew.